um, uh, lovies. It's, um, it's David McGee here with uh, another edition of Little Did You Know. It's a chat show in which I talk to people I find interesting. I hope you agree. It's um, a very special edition. It's the last. It's the final one here on YouTube. <clears throat> So from next week onwards, everything moves exclusively to patron, Patreon. So you'll have uh, the interviews as before, plus the strange and rare videos and all the oddities. There's more of a reason than ever before uh, to become a subscriber. And if you're not, here's the link which allows this to happen. So my final guest here on uh, YouTube. Uh, he's an actor and he's uh, renowned for one particular film from the 1980s. Since the turn of the century though, we haven't seen much of him. So uh, what's he been up to and why now is he talking to me? Well, we're talking comeback. How marvellous and uh, how lovely to be able to say Thank you for joining us, Tony Forsyth. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. How are we? I'm sure we're all absolutely uh, lovely, uh, Tony, as am I, uh, because uh, here we are together on Little Did You Know. Um, I did a bit of research, as always, and uh, according to um, one notoriously unreliable site, uh, you were born in 1984, so that means that um, when you were in Brookside, you were a bit younger than I thought. You were two. <laughs> and what's this? The first line on your Wikipedia entry, noted for his Scouse accent. Did you know that? I didn't. Well, OK, you've undeniably got one, <laughs> i.e. a Scouse accent but how do you feel about that defining you it's a bit disappointing really but however you know i i listen i'm very proud of where i come from so i'm whatever label i don't care you're okay with that mm. have you ever played a role in which you've used something other than your liverpudlian accent I certainly have uh what can we um demonstrate right now um uh, my very first show was done in Barnsley but I'm also I think quite good at a Belfast accent so where I would normally say something like hello there how are you today I'm very well how are you now Belfast is one of the trickier ones but can I tell you uh, Tony that according to research um, Liverpudlian is our favorite accent and Northern Irish is our second and I think it's because they're both very friendly accents. There's something about them. There's definitely a certain warmth. Yeah. But I would also include Newcastle in that too. Oh, Geordie, yes, without a doubt. Uh, Tony, have you ever been known, for whatever reason, to exaggerate your Scouse accent? <laughs> um, no. Never? No, don't think so. You've never put it on? Oh, no. This voice is the real... You. This is the real Tony Forsyth, yeah. You're not putting it on. No. <laughs> I mentioned at the top of the show that, um, uh, well, round about the uh, turn of the century, you kind of took a break, didn't didn't you? I did. And um, so what's all this about uh, something that's going to happen, well, in the near future? You're, you're, you are thinking about getting back into the business, aren't you? I'm really wanting to come back, yeah. Um, it's something that uh, I've been thinking about for some time. I left uh, or wanted to leave the business because in the 2000s um, or 10th of the century even, basically for me, it was all about reality TV. Mm. And that really disappointed me because when I was growing up, it was really important to get badges. And, you know, I, I wanted to do a lot of rep theatre. I wanted to kind of go into the Royal Shakespeare Company, which I did, the National Theatre, which is what I did tour various different places number one venues doing Shakespeare because to me that's where you learn your craft on the actual floor and then reality TV comes in and then all of these people who were on these shows were all of a sudden in panto earning 75,000 pounds a week and just 
had no skill or craft at all and it really bothered me and I just fell out of love with the whole game. Do you think the situation's changed now? I think it's 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 on a turn, which is why I'm coming back. Aha! Uh -huh. We're going to talk more about that, uh, Tony. But first of all, we have to uh, go back to the beginning. Um, so can you fill in the gap uh, briefly between um, Birth and Brookside? Now, my feeling is that it might involve youth theatre, something like that? Yes, that's very true. OK, so I <clears throat> discovered at school um, the lesson drama and I thought this is what I really want to do. So I went to the Everyman Youth Theatre, Profound Youth Theatre, uh, very famous in Liverpool, and I joined the Youth Theatre there. I stayed there for a couple of years, we did a couple of productions, and then I went to Manchester Youth Theatre, which is a, a residential youth theatre. So you go there, you stay there for six or seven weeks, and then you perform at a venue like the Royal Exchange or the Library Theatre or other said venues in Manchester. Great experience. Oh, you're marvellous, yeah. Now, I'm guessing there might be a connection between Brookside and your appearance in the film we mentioned earlier, which is, in fact, The Fruit Machine. Am I right? You are. How did it come about? Oh uh, Well, the connection in regards to the Brookside and the Fruit Machine is that Frank Clark, the writer of The Fruit Machine, was also one of the very starter writers of Brookside. Hmm. I uh, thought as much. Now, um, if you haven't seen The Fruit Machine, um, well, it's easy to find. Um, integrity being what it is, uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly where to find it because it's probably been stolen. But all I can say is that you, you can find it fairly easily. And um, so let's talk about The Fruit Machine because it had a tremendous impact uh, back in uh, 1988. Now, what interests me particularly about this film, Tony, is that it includes a couple of people that subsequently disappeared. So the film is about uh, two uh, gay teenagers who witness a murder and then they go on the run. One is you <laughs> and the other is Emil Charles, Craig Charles's brother. Now, you know, it's a case of who knew. Uh, but again, he disappeared around about the 90s. Have you kept in touch? No, 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 no. We don't know where he is then. No, we well, we do know he's living in London somewhere. But, ah, no. but that's all. Yeah, yeah. Hmm, two uh, very good performances, and it's it's strange that uh, Emil uh, has has disappeared. And well, as for the writer Frank Clark, now he um, famously disappeared after his last film, Blonde Fist. But you were telling me, um, Tony, that uh, I think there was some kind of anniversary for the uh, Fruit Machine, and uh, he turned up about uh, ten years ago. So what had he been doing? Well, <clears throat> that's right. There, there was a, a an anniversary of Frank or of Frank's work in Liverpool's Fact Theatre, which is a cinema where they we all well we were invited to, to attend. Frank, myself, and a couple of others were doing a Q and A, um, celebrating his film. So, so that was it. Yeah. And another of his films, uh, famously, is uh, Letter to Brezhnev. Indeed. So, um, uh, did you get an impression about what Frank does now? Um, to be honest with you, no. I I, I can't say I, I do know what Frank is up to right now. I, no, I, I don't know. Mm hmm. Mysterious. Now, um, uh, The Fruit Machine um, takes place, as I say, around about the uh, mid-80s when the, the gay scene was very different. So if you wanted to go to a gay club, you had to knock on a door and then a panel would open and somebody would check you out to see if you were OK to be let in. Um, so in The Fruit Machine, this, this does happen and the, the door is opened magnificently by Robbie Coltrane in drag. Yes, it's true. Now, inside uh, the gay club, was that a genuine club? In which case, where is it? Or... Okay, it's not a genuine club. It was the old Fruit Exchange, which is on Dale Street in Liverpool. No. There it was, yeah. So that is a set? It, yes, absolutely. It was turned into a nightclub. Well, I've learned something already then. Thank you very much indeed. Um, in that sequence, in, in, the, uh, in the gay bar, uh, Tony, you take part in a dance competition. Okay, well, 
In my view, you shouldn't have won it. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Oh, let's be frank. It doesn't appear to be one of your skills. No, 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 absolutely not. No, so you had, but you had to do it, and you you threw in um, some uh, other moves that were a bit surprising. So you you start skipping and boxing, and indeed boxing. Yes, whose idea was that? Unfortunately, it was mine. I thought it would help and enhance the character because the character of Michael was that he was a scally kid who would do anything to protect his friend, and it was all about survival. And it just displayed that extra element of survival. Indeed, it does come across. Now, one of the most extraordinary uh, sequences in the film... I'm just going to keep the camera on your face here, Tony, because I know it's going to bring back memories... There's a blonde bimbo um, who uh, does a topless show for the kiddies at the Dolphinarium. Do you remember that, Tony? I do. Yes, yes, I do. Uh, what was going on in Frank Clark's mind at that point? <clears throat> I'm going to have to pass on that one, to be quite frank with you, because <laughs> it really did lose its way a little on that, uh, that sequence. Uh, just a little. And... Um, uh, Finally, at the end of the uh, very exciting uh, chase, um, the finale is set on uh, the West Pier at Brighton. Now, I'm a great fan of Abandoned Engineering. In fact, that's one of my favourite shows on the Yesterday channel. Uh, the West Pier at Brighton is now uh, half a dozen girders sticking out of the English Channel. Indeed. But in those days, when you were making the, the fruit machine, uh, the West Pier was still standing. Now, <clears throat> it looks pretty derelict even then. What was it like? It was derelict. It was run down, um, but it, at that point, obviously, it hadn't caught fire. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a really great experience, I've got to say. It must have been, yes. What was uh, still there? Were you working in the old theatre at the end of the pier? Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. The whole place was completely abandoned and the, we shot quite a lot of the film on that pier. And were there um, health and safety issues in those days? Oh, it was a very different world than what it is today. In all honesty, you could have gone straight through the floor into the water, <laughs> couldn't you? It's very true, very true, yes. <laughs> you took your life in your hands. <laughs> all in the name of art. Mm. <laughs> Well then, Tony. Well, um, uh, the the fruit machine, like uh, another coming of age uh, film that came along ten years later called uh, Beautiful Thing, um, meant a lot to uh, boys in the eighties and early nineties who were discovering their sexuality. And I mean, there the weren't many um, LGBT role models at that time, but these two films are so fondly remembered by people. And if you do go online, I mean, there's, there's whole screeds of praise from now grown men who, who say things like, the fruit machine changed my life. I've had many messages of that nature. Really? Many, yeah. What, what kind of thing do people say to you? <clears throat> Basically, I didn't feel I could come out because I was a growing up in a family where this this kind of thing was unacceptable i was a scally or i was a, a ruffian or I, I i i wasn't a lot of people tell me that they weren't camp you know so it was more to do with and what what was going on inside and how my character helped bring that out and, and make it acceptable they also say uh, that it's a very moving film and, um, you know, you'll notice a, a lot of people saying, I still cry at the end. Uh, it, it's, it, it is a tragic ending, I suppose, you know, and uh, you follow the journey between these two boys and, um, well, I don't want to sound obvious, but, you know, the drama ensues, you know. <laughs> it, it, it does indeed. How do you feel? Um, well, first of all, Working on a, a, a big film, your first film, what was it like? Was it awe inspiring or did you just fit right in? Uh, both. Uh, it was awe inspiring, but I made sure I, I, I fitted in because I threw myself in it. That's what I'd always wanted, what I'd always dreamt of. So it was, I was, 
I was very comfortable because I also had a leading role in it. So it was really, um, it was an easy transition for me. And how do you feel now looking back on the fruit machine? Listen, I'm very proud of the work. I, I think it's a, you know, okay, it's a film that kind of loses its way, but I also think it was a statement film. I thought it was a film that really shouted for the time, if you like. And, um, you know, it, it's, it, it really opened a lot of people's eyes. And I, I listen, I, I, I couldn't ask for more. You're proud of it? Yeah, very much so. Marvellous. Um, after that, uh, you did uh, a, a couple more uh, bits in films, in uh, The Tall Guy and uh, Edward II. Uh, you also played uh, leads on TV. And um, what's this about uh, a film you made in Germany that um, may or may not have been about the Beatles? What was that called? It was called Hard Days, Hard Nights. Uh, and it was effectively set in Hamburg. And it was all about the Beatles' journey. Uh, included actors like Rita Tushingham and Al Corley. Al Corley was, he played uh, Stephen in Dynasty, but also had an unknown, uh, Nick Moran. Uh -huh. He was in the band with us. It was all about, obviously, about the Beatles. I was one of them, so was Nick Moran. But, um, and he then went on to do Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels, amongst the whole raft of other work, and a nice boy. Um, so it, it's it's about a band that is like the Beatles, also the, getting a, their break in Hamburg. Yeah, very much Beatles in disguise. Let me tell you. Uh, which Beatle were you? Paul McCartney. Really? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I would much have been, been preferred to have been John Lennon. Hmm. <laughs> um, where did this film uh, play, Tony? And did it get a release? Because I've never seen it. I'd love to. Uh, I don't know whether it got a um, an English release. Mm. I'm not too sure. W Nick and I, and amongst others, went to see the premiere in Hamburg. Did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but we obviously saw it in in subtitles because mm -hmm. there were our, our, all our voices were were voiced over. Oh, really? Yeah. So uh, you're all speaking German. Indeed. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that. Mm. Um, so after that, uh, let's move on to the, the stage career, uh, Tony, because as you said, there's been a, a, a lot of it. But uh, I, I want to talk specifically about one of your co-stars who um, has also been a guest on this show. Now... If you've seen uh, the episode with Penny Diamond, and um, if you have, you won't have forgotten it, in, in all honesty. <laughs> She's a character. We love her. So um, tell us more about this. You worked with Penny. Um, where and in what? OK, I was cast in my very first Shakespeare production of Much Ado About Nothing for the Oxford Stage Company which was directed by a very well-known Romanian director called Alexandru Davier. <coughs> uh, Penny was cast in it, and um, we went on a, I don't know, was it six to eight-month tour, as far as I can recall? Number, number one venues in the UK, but we also had the fortunate op uh, opportunity to go to Kuala Lumpur, where we performed for six weeks. They didn't have any theatres in, in Kuala Lumpur, so it was a more, more of a, a conference centre, really. Yeah. And then from Kuala Lumpur, we went to Tokyo, where we performed at the Globe Theatre. Now, the Globe Theatre in Tokyo is a direct replica of the Globe Theatre in the South Bank, Bank on London. Didn't know that. Hmm? How, you were doing much ado about nothing. How did it go down in, let's pick, Tokyo? Yeah, it's marvellous. Absolutely wonderful, yeah. So were you uh, performing to um, expats or Japanese with a very good knowledge of English or a mixture of both? A mixture of both for that reason, yeah. Mm. 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 Lots, of, lots of expats and lots of students studying English. Uh, of course, yes. And um, uh, how was it working with the lovely Penny? <laughs> oh, Penny, she is as mad as a box of frogs, but adorable with it, I've got to say. Um, yes, yeah, she's just a lovely, 
zany woman, you know, and, and you know, that's what she is. She's, she's gorgeous, you know. Mm. And uh, uh, we talked on, on the show about the fact that she does have the loudest voice in in the business and this is very important to her because as she said on the show she thinks that projection is not taught in drama schools anymore she goes to the theater and at the back of the stalls she can't hear anyone yeah. do you agree oh absolutely i do agree yeah i think it's very frustrating <laughs> especially for people who are paid i know <laughs> mm -hmm. uh tony we're going to talk uh, more about your career and indeed what you've been doing since okay. the early 2000s and because I'm not sure about this either but uh, right now we're going to take a break we're going to have a look at a new film um, from Peccadillo now this is called Lola and the Sea it's a road movie with a father and daughter but there's more to it than that have a look at this and then join us again in a couple of minutes. Comment ça va en ce moment? Ça va. Le traitement me fait du bien. Je me sens mieux. Pourquoi tu veux faire ça? De toute façon, que je fasse cette opération ou pas, ça changerait au fait que je suis déjà une femme. Faut juste l'accepter, c'est tout. Comment t'es venu me faire ça? Tu te rends compte que tu m'as fait rater l'enterrement de maman? Jamais tu pourras réparer ça. Réparer quoi? T'as déjà tout cassé? Putain, parfois! Tu vas la remettre sur ton petit meuble Je suis l'emmener au bord de la mer dans sa maison d'enfance. C'est elle qui me l'avait demandé. T'as pas fini tes conneries Sors Sors de là Je la laisserai pas Soit tu descends, soit on y va. Elle est où À la mer. Alors tu te fais appeler Lola maintenant Très classe. Oh mais con Putain Je sais pas ce que tu veux prouver, mais tu viens avec moi sur là. Non, je suis bien ici. Moi je bouge pas. Tu me touches pas Ça suffit C'est l'office, je fais ce que je veux. Je te demande une seule chose, qu'on finisse ce qu'on est venu faire. On le fait pour elle. Elle te manque Ouais. Faut savoir dire merde à ses parents de temps en temps. C'est courageux. Ma princesse. Maman. Avec toi, j'ai toujours eu l'impression que tout était possible. Connard Et que ce qui était important dans la vie, c'est ce qu'on croyait soi, et pas ce que pensaient les autres. I'm David McGillivray, and uh, with me here uh, today on the very last episode of Little Did You Know on YouTube is my special guest, Tony Forsyth, uh, we've been talking about uh, his film, uh, The Fruit Machine, but uh, just then you saw a trailer for a new Peccadillo release called Lola and the Sea, and it's brand new. It plays in cinemas uh, from the 17th of December. And uh, as you may have noticed, that uh, film features a new trans actor called Maya Bolaires, and already she's been... Uh, voted the most promising actress at the Magritte Awards in Belgium. That's Lola and the Sea. Catch it from the 17th of December. Um, just before the break, uh, Tony, we were talking about your stage career. It's been uh, very illustrious. But I also want to talk about um, uh, two shows you did, and I've heard so many stories about these plays because they were created by yet another of my guests, Peter Benedict. Yes, so we're talking about Naked Flame and Naked Flame 2. And um, what happened, I think, uh, with Peter at this time, Tony, is that he managed to capture the zeitgeist suddenly possibly for the first time large parties of women wanted to go to the theater to see casts of semi-naked men yes one of them was tony tell us about naked flame tony it was much more than just a strip show shall we say mm -hmm. it was a comedy it was a farce. It was a, a, an opportunity to, for ladies to actually see a genuine, funny, farcical production, but have that slight titillation with it too. 
As I said, I have heard so many stories about your adventures on the road. You were touring for, I don't know how long? Three years. Three years. Mm. And the audiences were, how shall we say, enthusiastic. Well, in certain cities they were. Ah. Liverpool, mm. Belfast. I mean, major cities. It was a massive hit. Um, it was a great opportunity, as I say, for, for hen parties, a, a group of girls just to have a, a get away from the husbands or partners and just have a good laugh. And that's what it was. It was a release, an, an enjoyable one to boot. So in, in huge theatres, as in Liverpool, was, what, 90% of the audience female? <laughs> well, at the Empire Theatre, for example, it is a 3,000 auditorium. I so. And I would suggest that it would be... 85% women mm -hmm. and 15% men, yeah. <laughs> so did you expect this? I mean, I, presumably, as this, you know, it's, it's a whole new form of entertainment. Peter didn't tell you anything about the fact that, you know, most of the audience are going to be women and they're going to go wild. No, we had no idea at all. Absolutely none whatsoever. I mean, we could obviously see that it was... Yeah, we thought it was going to be 60, 40, if I'm going to be completely honest with you, but it wasn't. It was 90, 85, you know, 15 or 90, 10, and in some cases 95, you know, 5. But um, no, it was it was a great fun, but we didn't, we had no idea the reaction that we would get. <laughs> uh, tell us uh, briefly, uh, because I haven't described it, about the, the, the plot in quotes of N Naked Flame. Uh, where was it set? In a fire station. <laughs> Um, and basically it's everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And it was lots of false alarms and beds going up and pandemonium, uh, people with hoses in the wrong area. It was just, it was, as I say, it's very funny, but, um, but yeah, if you had, if you were lucky enough to see it, I'm sure that you had a great night out. Uh, we're talking um, classic British farce, in mm, in yeah. fact, and only only recently I did see it on uh, a VHS tape, and 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 you've got everything. Yes, the the doors opening and closing at the, at the same time, and the beds coming down, and indeed then disappearing with people still on them. Yeah. Hmm. All about timing. It, it, and the timing is immaculate. Yeah, well, that's, that's where innuendo comes from, isn't it, really? You know? Indeed. Um, uh, nicely done by my uh, guest, Peter Benedict. Brilliant director. Uh, who's also in it. <laughs> Surprise. Yes. Um, what we really want to know, uh, Tony, though, is about bad behaviour in hotel rooms. <sighs> Okay. <laughs> um, there was plenty of bad behaviour, to be completely honest with you. Mm -hmm. However, um, oh, he's struggling. Here. Uh, yeah, I'm. Peter's a friend of mine, so um, it's very difficult conversation. He, really. he will be watching. Um, you can bet on that, and he's quite happy, uh, apparently, for you to say anything, for you to speak your mind. Oh, okay then, Peter. Um, well, right. Basically, we had a new guy come into the show, very first show, and Peter took a liking to him. And um, basically, I said to the said actor, who turned out to be quite famous, um, I'll no mention of any names, but anyway, he. Um, I said, you be careful of said people because he's a bit of a dirty bastard. And next day in rehearsals, um, <clears throat> as our director was giving notes, he suddenly undid his shirt and revealed a T-shirt that said, dirty bastard. So he was very proud of himself and his <laughs> behaviour patterns. It was great fun, I must say. Lovely, lovely touch of, of humour from him. And when I said to Peter um, yesterday, um, um, my final guest is uh, Tony Forsyth. That was that, that was the text he sent me, dirty bastard. <laughs> I'm not surprised, to be honest with you. It was a running theme. You know. uh, so uh, larks galore um, on two tours of Naked Flame. Yes. Pleased to hear it. But then, and here here we come to the nub of the programme. So then things 
go quiet uh, for you. So, um, exactly what happened? Well, as I, I finished Naked Flame, and it was again, this was in 2004. So, again, reality tea was at its height, effectively. And I just thought, this is not good for me. I was really, really downhearted and disappointed and just felt disillusioned with the whole industry. It's, I, I couldn't fathom how actors, certainly like myself, or others, and many more before me, would go and get these um, well, badges, for want of a better phrase, but really kind of, you know, enhance skill, craft, all that kind of stuff. And then these actors, these people rather, from from reality TV would come in and take all of the pantomime jobs. So they would be earning £75,000 a week, which then, and still is today, a huge amount of money. But they, it, it, it wasn't warranted in my mind. And I just fell out of love with the whole business. So what I did was I thought, well, what can I do? Because I don't know anything. I didn't have a trade, I didn't have a skill. I didn't have anything of that nature, so I thought... Because well, let, let, let's be honest now, how old were you when you did The Fruit Machine? I was uh, 17. <gasps> mm, so you, you were, uh, the character 17, you were playing uh, 17 at 17, which isn't common. Yeah. And prior to that work... You well, I was in like... Brookside, I was in Bread, I was in a thing about John Lennon. Uh, everything I'd ever done, I was in youth theatre, it was all geared towards wanting to be a professional mm. actor. But then, so we come back to this century, you were depressed, quite understandably, but what did you do? Were you then consciously actually turning down acting work? No, I wasn't turning down. I wasn't putting myself into the mix. Ah. Uh, and what I thought I would do is, because I didn't have a skill or a trade, was um, sales, because if sales is a job that if you speak to people and you can yes. help them, so on and so forth, it, but you do have to have that skill set of, of of addressing an audience. Cool. And now, obviously, that's an area that wasn't a problem for me. So I did excel in that area. Then you get used to the money. Um, so you were <clears throat> a success as a salesman. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. but, um, but all along, I had this itching to get back. You only have one life. And I've mm. realised that what I really, really want to do is what I've always wanted to do, mm. was just be a professional actor. What were you selling, Tony? I was going into schools and selling them a TV channel. So I was enabling young people to effectively make their own content oh. and then utilise that on their own platform. So if your school was called St. Michael's, for example, it would be St. Michael's TV. Hmm. And it'll be all about the school, events that are going on within the school, interspersed with a variety of small productions or, or opportunities that will present themselves within the school. So it would all be about the school. So I would have thought this would be uh, quite rewarding work, helping children. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Because what we also did was then provided the actual kit to make their own content to put them onto the, the channel. So it was, uh, yeah, it was really rewarding for me because... It was enabling young people to have an outlet, a platform, you know, um, and you didn't have one when I was when I was eighteen or fourteen or whatever like that. There's no such thing as 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 YouTube and the rest of it, you know. So, yeah, it's, it was a different gig altogether. Of course. So you were going into schools and you were in effect um, giving a performance and you were speaking lines that you'd learned. Indeed. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So it wasn't a bad job. No, no, no. Respect. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was the, obviously there was a close relation going on with regard to addressing people and, and encouraging young people to come out to themselves and, and be who they wanted to be, you know, uh, and saying that, and this was a platform. So it, there was a, there was a slight synchronization going on. Mm -hmm. Now, um, while we're on uh, the subject of uh, children, I happen to know, because you told me uh, a few months ago, that you have been involved in a theatre project involving children. So um, tell us more about that. When and where did it happen? OK, well, it all started off in, in Greenwich in London. Uh, in the mid-90s, I set up a youth theatre, Greenwich Youth Theatre, funny enough, and um, we had lots and lots of people from around the area. But what we did is that we put uh, notices in all of the shops 
saying that we were going to be doing a particular production. What we managed to do is about 12 productions over in a five year period, but each and every production we're going to a professional venue. So I was taking young people from the street as such and putting them into a working pro pro uh, professional productive environment. And what we would do is that we would go and hire our Greenwich Theatre so the young people of the of the area could get, then go into areas like the green room and find out what the whole professional performance and um, uh, experience was all about. What was it like working with these uh, kids, as you say, off the street? Oh, it was, again, it was real, and that's what I—that's what—that's uh, what I'm all about. Yeah. Moving fast forwarding now, uh, in Merseyside, where I now live, I've just recently set up another youth theatre, mm -hmm. and again, it's the same premise as such. But we've just finished a production of Matilda the Musical, and um, that was done during the summer holidays. Ah, I I didn't know this this had happened. How did it go down? It went very well. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. So you directed it. I did. How do you find directing, Tony? Um, especially with young people, I, I love it. I love it because, um, the, it's the experience that they go through, the journey that they have, and it really gives me a lot of pleasure that because um, otherwise these people wouldn't have had. A, that experience of going into a professional venue and performing. And um, a lot of young people uh, really, really get a lot out of it. And that gives me a lot too. Mm -hmm. You're discovering untapped talent. Quite, yeah. If I can guide anybody to go into the business or encourage anybody to even just have a go, then, then, then I think that's a, a really good thing. The confidence that it brings the individual, everything that, 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 that the support from um, being yourself to being able to express, be, is, I just think it's unbeatable. Well, there's a chance you might do this again then. You, you'd like to. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think, um, you know, I, I, I think being an actor is a lot easier than being a director because as a director, you have to cater and worry and be concerned about so many different aspects. Whereas as, a, as an actor, all you're effectively about is your own performance. Mm -hmm. Mm. Whereas as a director, you've got to, it's everyone's performance. It's the production. It's it's one thing after another, after another, after another. But it does keep you on your toes. Mm -hmm. And do you like being in control? Oh yes. Oh good. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Now, uh, have you tried anything else over the past um, few years uh, just to uh, keep body and soul together, Tony? Have is it true you were a casting director? It was. Um, this all came about when I received a phone call on a Sunday morning in my flat in Greenwich um, saying, hi, I'm a researcher for Crime Watch. Uh, would you like to come to Birmingham? And I thought it was a bit of a wind up because it was a kind of 9.13 on a Sunday morning, whatever it may be. Anyway, the long and short of it is that I did go to Birmingham that day. I met with the director and on arrival, he went, hi, hi. And instantly you could feel that there was something wrong. I asked what was wrong uh, and enticed that out of me, said, the problem is that you're going to go into a, to rob a bank with a gun. Hooray. Yes. Um, however, the character that you're going to be playing is 53. I was 32 at the time. Mm -hmm. oh, so I was very disappointed with this. So once I said to him, why would I have been cast? Or why would you... Why would you have called me, you know? Um, he said, well, because we don't have a casting director. So I said, you do on Monday morning. No. So they, I, I basically uh, compiled a group of my friends and people to, um, to set up a, an agency called Vital Casting. And we went on to be the casting director for Crime Watch for five years. We did every improvisation stroke reconstruction. Uh, it led on to various different other things like the great dome robbery. Um, where I'm sure you're only too aware, but in 1999 or 2000, uh, there was a, a massive attempt to get the, the Millennium Diamond. Uh, it was all very James Bond uh, and very exciting as well, you know. And yeah, so that's spoiler what alert: they oh. they didn't get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true, but there was a, it was a dramatic attempt with oh. speedboats and everything, you yes. know. So it was it was really good. What fun I would have thought your years as a casting director then, yeah. finding the right person, uh, you know, as opposed to what used to happen, for the right role. Well, let me tell you, when you have two, three days to find a four foot six yeah. inch Polish HGV <laughs> driver, 
um, you know, it's it can be difficult. It's a challenge. A challenge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. um, anything else you've done, Tony? Have you have you tried driving? Mini cab. Oh yeah. To be honest with Uber. you, Uber. Yes. Unfortunately, um, again, in order for me to get back into acting, what I needed to do was find a job that was flexible enough mm. so I could be able to go to auditions. So I thought by um, so I, I have I, I take people up and down the motorway now in a, in a in a van or such, you know, with um with all their luggage. So families go to and from airports. Uh, when I'm not doing that, then I'll put my Uber signs on and I will work the area in an Uber. I would have thought it's all good experience for an actor, though. Um, I mean, for example, do you talk to your passengers? Absolutely. So you meet a lot of people that you wouldn't otherwise meet. Oh, very much so, yeah. Uh, Useful? Yeah, of course it is, because what you're doing is you're, you're gaining characteristics from people that you wouldn't think were there, you know? So it just, it's a, a memory store bank thing for me. So in in your head, you're, you're, you're making notes and thinking, I'm going to use that one day. Absolutely, I am, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I love that particular layer, you know? <laughs> yes. Well, um, down to uh, brass tacks then, um, uh, Tony. You're coming back, which is marvellous news after, after a few years. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, you know, you know, we're told you're 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 still in your late thirties. No, let's be uh, frank. So, what's it going to be like coming back into the business as an older actor? I have no idea because I've never been an older actor before. Mm. But here I am. Um, listen, I want to give it one last shot. Why not? You know, what have I got to lose? You know, that's what I keep telling myself anyway. I I I just feel as if. You know, we only have one life, don't we? So let's make sure we can fulfil it to our most biggest and highest potential. And in an ideal world, what parts, what kind of parts would you like to be playing today? <sighs> to be completely honest with you, there are so many. I could be here all day saying, oh, I'd like to play this, I'd like to play that. But to be honest with you, I want to see what opportunity presents itself. I would like to focus a little bit more on television this time rather than theatre. And there's nothing that... Uh, theatre is my true love because it's live, but uh, I really need to kind of build up a bank of work again on television or film or both. Well, it, it occurs to me that you could play um, at least some of the parts that Stephen Graham turns down. Uh, to be completely honest with you, fair, fair play to Stephen Graham. What a fabulous actor he is. However, there must be stuff that he does. Whatever role he does, I always say, I wish I could have done that. Uh, but listen, I say he's a fabulous actor. But the things that he doesn't want to do, mm. casting directors out there, yeah. give me a shout. Uh, he, he he's in everything at the moment. I mean, you know, you know what I mean. Every time I put the TV on, there he is. Um, okay, he um, is often Scouse. But he is versatile and obviously the word goes out now. Basically, we want Stephen Graham for this. Or if he's not available, can we get a Stephen Graham type? Indeed, yes. And that's, that, here I am. Then, and there, <laughs> that's where Tony steps in. Yes. Hmm. Um, this work has it already started, uh, Tony. Have you got your... Uh, Fingers in the pies now. The pies just being made. Mm. Uh, the fingers are about to go in. How uh, marvellous. Um, we, we look forward to um, more news. Now, um, uh, Tony, uh, as you say, you're, you're, you're back in Liverpool. Um, tell us about your uh, family. You've got uh, two sons. I have three children. Three? Yes. I have. How are, how are they doing? They're very good. I have a 17 year old boy, a 16 year old boy, and a seven year old daughter who came to us as a complete surprise. Ah. Just very quickly, once I um, I sat my two boys down and said that we we're having a new addition to the family, my 10 year old and their nine year old burst out in tears thinking they were going to get a dog. <laughs> Have, have they say, got, they've got used to the idea now. <laughs> only just. But needless to say, we don't have a dog. Mm. And our daughter was born. So, um, yeah. 
Lovely. Uh, what are your sons up to? Uh, well, my eldest, 17-year-old, is in a sixth form college, um, about to attend uni, or hoping to attend uni, rather, uh, in Leeds. Uh, and my 16-year-old boy is a St. John Ambulance cadet, desperate to be a paramedic. Will have nothing else in his life. He is solely focused and has been since he's 11 years old. He's now 16, but there's nothing more that will, will stop in his way. Excellent. But they have no desire to follow in their father's footsteps. No, that's where my daughter comes into ah, play. Ah, tell she, us. Yes, she is. Uh, she was in my latest production of um, Matilda. Ah. And um, yes, yeah, she is definitely the one with, the, with those type of genes, shall we say. Yes. Yeah. Her, uh, does she have a particular talent? Could it be acting, singing, dancing, or all three? I'm afraid it's all a combination of them all. She's a show off. Triple threat yeah, and a show off. What yes. could possibly go wrong? Tony, it's been delightful. Thank you so much Thank for you. being my last guest on Little Did You Know. Being right my greatest pleasure. Here Thank on you very YouTube. much. It's been uh, lovely. So um, it's not a case, uh, as usual, of me saying, join me next week. Um, but everything will continue on uh, Patreon. So um, one last reminder, if you're not a subscriber, <clears throat> there's the link. Uh, join us on Patreon from next week. More interviews, uh, more strange videos and more oddities. Uh, we keep going, in other words. From me, David McGillivray, and my special guest, Tony Forsyth, it's mwah. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.